Well, please turn with me in your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, and we will read the first 14 verses. My first encounter with the writings of John Owen, the great 17th century Puritan pastor theologian, was reading volume 10. As I said yesterday, it's not a sensible place to begin reading Owen. But the second encounter I had with Owen was reading volume 6. I began to read it on a bus. I was traveling from Edinburgh to the Scottish borders to take part in an inter-varsity student conference. And as I read Owen on the mortification of sin, I had this thought, this man knows my heart. Layer after layer was being peeled away, and the truth of God was piercing its way into my heart. I want to speak in the second address on the work of the Holy Spirit and mortification, the putting to death of sin. There is so much I would love to be saying, first to myself and then to yourselves, but I want to do something that I've only ever done once before, and we'll come to that uh, in a few minutes. But if you have the inclination, and if you want to be a godly Christian, I hope you have the inclination, uh, buy or begin to read John Owen on volume 6. It's the substance of teaching that he gave to teenagers in Oxford. Now, a teenager in Oxford in uh, 1650 is a little different from a teenager in California in 2022. But uh, Owen preached these sermons to teenagers, and they are redolent with power, with grace. They're full of memorable um, epithets and aphorisms, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. He who tramples not over the bellies of his lusts makes no progress in sanctification. And then this great statement, this is Owen, set faith on Jesus Christ for the killing of thy sin. That is Owen. He's got much else to say, uh, practical, helpful, insightful teaching on how do we put sin to death. But that statement captures the heart of what Owen wants to say to us. Set faith on Jesus Christ for the killing of thy sin. And it's that statement that I really want to unpack with you this morning. But we'll read Romans 8 from the first verse, setting the context for Paul's teaching. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. <coughs> so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Notice the connection between verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> Those who by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body will live for, notice the connective particle, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And what Paul is saying to these, these Roman Christians is that the great ministry of the Spirit in you is to put the sin that yet remains in you to death, thereby showing that you are the sons of God. In other words, the sons of God, and by that he means those who are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, men and women, the sons of God are those who diligently, by the Spirit, put sin to death. They do not live comfortably with sin. They do not live complacently with sin. With the Spirit's help, they make war with sin. And in so doing, they show themselves to be the authentic sons of God. Now, we saw in the last address that the Holy Spirit initiates as it were, on behalf of the Godhead, new life in the people of God. He plants sovereignly, mysteriously, the seed of new life within us. He takes away hearts of stone, and He gives us hearts of flesh, hearts that beat with love to God and faith in Jesus Christ. Thomas Chalmers, I mentioned his name, you may not be familiar with it. He was perhaps the greatest Scotsman of the 19th century. He was the first moderator of the Free Church of Scotland in 1843 when 474 ministers left the National Church to form a more biblical uh, reformed denomination, the Free Church of Scotland. And he preached what has commonly been regarded as one of the greatest sermons uh, of the Christian era. And the title is The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And in that sermon, uh, I was looking at it and reading it recently, uh, Chalmers is saying that when we are called and summoned by God, to turn from sin and to embrace righteousness, what we need to understand is that the great means by which God would have us turn from sin and embrace righteousness is not to issue commands, but to proclaim Jesus Christ, the Savior given by God for the life of the world. He comes in the virtue and grace of who He is and what He has done and expulsively creates within us a new affection. 
He wants us to understand that it is the gospel that comes in its grace and power to take residence within us. Nothing will more compel us, persuade us, encourage us to give ourselves to righteousness and to do battle with indwelling sin than daily fresh discoveries of a new affection. Set forth Christ. And that's what Owen means when he says, set faith on Jesus Christ for the killing of your sin. Now, the new birth, the birth from above, is but the beginning of new life. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter puts it at the end of his second letter. We are to grow up into Jesus Christ. The new birth initiates new life within us, but that new life is to mature. We see it uh, prototypically in our Savior Jesus Christ. He had no sin. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, and yet we are told that he grew in favor with God and with man. He wasn't excused the maturative processes of spiritual life. He learned obedience, says the writer to the Hebrews, through the things he suffered. You remember the third servant's song, morning by morning he wakens my ear to hear. How did the Lord Jesus Christ know the Holy Scripture so well? How was He able when Satan came and tempted Him in the wilderness when for 40 days and 40 nights He, he was without sustenance? How was He able in His weakness surrounded by wild animals, not like Adam in a lavish garden, but by, in a wilderness with wild animals? How was He able to respond to the temptations of Satan Quoting directly from uh, Deuteronomy 8 and twice from Deuteronomy 6, he didn't have a Torah in his back pocket. He didn't have a Hebrew lexicon and say, just wait a minute, Satan, let me read up. There must be a verse somewhere in the Bible that God has inspired. No, he knew the Scriptures, but how did he know the Scriptures? Not by a channel from his deity uh, finding its way into his humanity. That would make him unable to be our Savior. He wouldn't have a true humanity. Morning by morning, he wasn't excused the maturative processes of intellectual, intellective reading, pondering, thinking, going to the synagogue, listening to his mother, reading the scrolls, hiding the Word of God in his heart that he might not sin against God. The Christian life is a life of maturative process and progress. The new birth initiates that maturative process, which has an omega point. And the omega point is not that we become like Jesus Christ, is it? That's not the omega point of God. The omega point is that having been made into the likeness of Christ, he will be the firstborn among many brothers. Brothers and sisters, God's ultimate purpose does not concern you or me, ultimately. It concerns his son. Don't misunderstand me. We belong to that great ultimate purpose. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those he predestined to what purpose and to what end? To be conformed to the likeness of his son in order that a henna clause of consequence, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So, our new birth and our growth in grace is ultimately to be for the exaltation of Jesus Christ, that we will become creaturely analogs of the Son of God, and he'll be the firstborn among many brothers. The question then is, how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? How do we grow up into Christ? 
Well, <laughs> there is so much uh, that could be said. We, we grow up into Christ within the context and fellowship of the people of God. You know, the Reformers passionately believed this extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Calvin quotes Cyprian approvingly. Because the church, the, the gathered people of God, is the ordinary context in which believers are planted in order that together we might know the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth, and together with all the saints, grow up into Christ. We were born again into union with Christ, and in union with Christ, into union with the people of Christ. We cannot be Christians outside ordinarily the communion of the saints manifested in the local congregation of the people of God. But what I want to focus on is one particular ministry of the Holy Spirit as He seeks to conform us to the likeness of the Son of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's His ministry of mortification. Verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. When the Holy Spirit comes and plants new life within us, He could, He could have eradicated every trace of sin within us. But God chose not to do that for His own glory and for our good. Sin remains to trouble us. Its guilt has been dealt with. Its power has been decisively broken. But it remains to trouble us, to humble us. There is a landing ground within us, as there was not in our Savior, for Satan to come and seek to cause us to succumb to his temptations. Some of you, I know, have been to Italy and perhaps have seen Michelangelo's uh, statue of David. It began life as a block of marble, but Michelangelo had in his mind something grand, and day by day, week by week, he would chip away at the block of marble, and slowly but surely, often painfully, this magnificent statue begins to take form. And that's what sanctification is. The Spirit comes and He, he chips away. We would love Him to come and in an avalanche of power remove every trace of remaining sin, but He doesn't. Or if perhaps, like me, you're, you're into golf, um, Greg Norman, um, famous Australian golfer, don't talk too much about him. He's involved in the LIV tour. I'm a PGA man. Um, but he was once asked, he's a golf architect, and he was once asked, you know, when, when, when you're coming to design a course, what, what's in your mind? And he said this, I want to remove everything that isn't golf course. He looks at the terrain of, I don't know, 100, 200 acres, and in his mind, he's thinking, golf course, golf course. I'm going to take away everything that isn't golf course. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. He comes to take away everything that isn't Jesus Christ. Almost the last words of our Lord Jesus, spoken to His disciples before His arrest. You remember them well. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knew how vulnerable these men were to the wiles of the devil and to the sin that yet remained within them. And prior to that, John 14, he had promised to send them the Holy Spirit as a helper. 
as a helper. It's a great word. Paul uses it in, in uh, verse uh, 16, the Holy, uh, verse 26 of Romans 8, the Holy Spirit comes to help us in our weakness. It's actually a 17-letter double Greek compound, and we call it help. It literally means sunantilambanitai, I think, soon together with, ante, but over against us, the Spirit comes to help us. And what, what the language is highlighting is that we are not inertly passive in our sanctification. We are in our regeneration, but not in our sanctification. We are to work with God who will will and to do of His good pleasure. The Holy Spirit comes to help us put sin to death. If by the Spirit you put to death, we have to do the killing, but it's the Spirit who enables us to do the killing. Lord, I can't but you can help me to do so. Without His help, we would be overwhelmed by our sin. But here's the question I want to now focus with you on for the remainder of our time. How does the Holy Spirit help us put sin to death? Normally, when I've preached in this passage, and I think I've preached in it, well, I, I don't know, 20, 30 times over 40 years, There are seven, eight, nine, ten points that I make. I want to make one point. And I'm a little hesitant because it's going to involve me in reading a large chunk of John Owen. Not one sentence, although his sentences can go on and on and on and on and on, but a paragraph and a half. And what I want to plead with you is bear with me. If you don't get it all, that's fine. I'll, I'll try and explicate it. Bear with me as much as you can. Gird up the loins of your minds. Um, do your best. Owen is expounding his great treatise, and it is a great treatise on the mortification of sin. I know a number of you have read it. And he's helping us to see how the Holy Spirit principally helps us to put sin to death. We all battle with remaining sin. We all have different sins that trouble us, humble us, shame us. And Owen says this, bring your sin to the rectitude and holiness of God's law. Okay, bring your sin to the holiness and the rectitude, the rightness and the righteousness of God's law. And we think, right, I'm on track, right? He wants me to take my sin. Maybe it's the sin of lust. Play it alongside the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. I remember how our Lord expands on that in Matthew uh, 5. But then Owen says this, bring your sin to the gospel. You've brought it to the law, um, and you, you've seen its heinousness, it's against God, its wickedness, its rebellion against the will of God, the way of God, the holiness of God. And then you're reading, and then Owen says, now he says, bring your sin to the gospel. And you think, oh, good, the gospel. Not for relief, but for further conviction of its guilt. Law, gospel. The law sends you to the gospel for pardon and peace and hope. And then the gospel sends you back to the law to relearn what it means to live a godly, pleasing life to the Most High. No says own. Bring your sin to the law, 
now bring it to the gospel to really see the sinfulness of sin. Thomas Goodwin, contemporary of Owens, uh, born, well, slightly older, born in 1600, I think Owens, Owens born in 1616, he dies in 1680. Uh, he said, if thou wouldst know what sin is, go to Mount Calvary. So here's the quote from Owen. Bear with me. If this doesn't work, I won't get invited back. So, <laughs> so here is John Owen. Remember the, the strap line, set faith on Jesus Christ for the killing of thy sin. Listen to Owen. Bring thy lust to the gospel, not for relief, but for further conviction of its guilt. Look on him whom thou hast pierced, and be in bitterness. Say to thy soul, what have I done? What love, what mercy, what blood, what grace have I despised and trampled on? Is this the return I make to the Father for his love, to the Son for his blood, to the Holy Ghost for His grace? Do I thus requite the Lord? Have I defiled the heart that Christ died to wash, that the blessed Spirit hath chosen to dwell in? And can I keep myself out of the dust? What can I say to the dear Lord Jesus? How shall I hold up my head with any boldness before Him? Do I account communion with Him of so little value that for this vile lust's sake I have scarce left Him any room in my heart? How shall I escape if I neglect so great salvation? In the meantime, what shall I say to the Lord? Love, mercy, grace, goodness, peace, joy, consolation. I've despised them all and esteemed them as a thing of naught, that I might harbor a lust in my heart. Have I obtained a view of God's fatherly countenance, that I might behold His face and provoke Him to His face? Was my soul washed, that room might be made for new defilements? Shall I endeavor to disappoint the end of the death of Christ? Shall I daily grieve that spirit whereby I am sealed for the day of redemption? Then says Owen, entertain thy conscience daily with this treaty. See if it can stand before this aggravation of its guilt. If this make it not sink in some measure and melt, I fear thy case is dangerous. Now, what is Owen saying here? He's saying, let me tell you about the gospel method of mortification. The gospel method of mortification is to do what Joseph does in Genesis 39. He's been abandoned by his family, sold into slavery. You know the story well. Life begins to look up. He becomes a steward in the household of Potiphar. <clears throat> Life's beginning to smile upon him. And Potiphar's wife comes along and she fancies the look of Joseph. I'll have him in my bed. And she seeks to seduce Joseph. Now, you don't need much imagination to, to think of the, the satanic suggestions. Joseph, grab life while you can. Life's turned out a misery. Your family have abandoned you, sold you. Here's a little opportunity to grasp at life. And Joseph says, how could I do such a thing and sin against God? Now, very 
Hebrew narrative is very sparse. Hebrew narrative almost never pauses to make moral comments or judgments. Hebrew narrative is really annoying. Um, the, the Bible is annoying. I find it annoying almost every day. Lord, you don't need to know this, Ian. But I mean, you don't need, that's all you need to know. The Bible leads us to join up the dots. How could I do thing, such a thing and sin against God? The God who entered into covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sovereign Lord of the cosmos who has come to this little ragtag of a people and said, I will be your God, the God of your children after you. What he does is to place alongside the temptation to sin that was seeking to arouse the remnants of corruption in the believing heart of this old covenant Christian. How could I do such a thing and sin against God? Owen is highlighting the gospel method of mortification. This is what Paul does, for example, in Ephesians 4, in verse 30. Remember how he urges the Ephesians not to grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The force of Paul's statement lies in what the Holy Spirit has done for us. He has sealed us for the day of redemption. And the seal, you remember, authenticates a document. And when someone becomes a Christian, God seals them. He authenticates them as his own. And here is Paul's point. The Holy Spirit is himself God's seal. He's going back to chapter 1, 13 and 14. Don't have time to unpack that. His presence is both the guarantee that we are not our own, we have been bought with a price, that the fullness of our salvation is assured, that Christians are redeemed. The Holy Spirit is God's seal that what He has promised us yet will most certainly come. Now, do you see what Paul is saying when he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Ephesians and the temptations they had to lie and slander and steal and get drunk. He's saying to them, how can you tell lies, practice anger, steal, speak unwholesome, dirty words, lust after your neighbor's wife, watch vile images on your computer, trash fellow blood-bought believers anonymously when you've been sealed by the Spirit? You see what he's doing? He's taking the gospel method of sanctification and saying, use that to mortify the sin that dwells within you. Let me give you another New Testament example in the book of James, chapter 4, where at verse 5, James, write, James writes, do you not see how deeply, greatly, passionately, ardently the Lord loves you? He is jealous over you. He yearns jealously by the Spirit. You know the passage. Um, Paul is use, uh, James is using bold, unimaginably bold language. God yearns over you. It's the same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in, in uh, Psalm 42, as, as the deer pants. God pants over you. He, he yearns over you. His heart goes out to you. And you see what James is saying. No husband wants his beloved to go elsewhere to have her needs met. God yearns over his people. And if physical adultery is abhorrent, what are we to say about spiritual adultery? And that's Owen's point here when he says we are to go to the gospel not first for relief, but to aggravate the heinousness of the temptation that we are in danger of succumbing to or the sin that we are practicing. The gospel shows us what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, how He has unimaginably blessed us, enriched us, made us joint heirs together with Him. 
I don't know how to preach that text in Romans 8, 17. I don't really know what it means. I can parse the language. I could parse every word in that sentence, and I don't know what it means to be a joint heir with Christ of the glory of God. What Owen is saying is precisely what the New Testament is saying and what Joseph was saying. The principal way, the principal way to confront sin, indwelling sin, is to bring the gospel to bear upon it in two ways. First of all, to show us how vile and wicked it is. If I were to succumb to this temptation, I'd be trampling on the blood of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I would be despising the love of God who so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son. I would be doing despite to the Spirit of God who has come to sanctify me, not to allow me to continue in sin so that grace may abound. Remaining sin troubles us every day of our lives, and that's why we need every day to be gospel men and women, boys and girls. We need every day to go back to the bloodshed on Calvary's cross. We need to go back to the love of the Father, because Christ did not come to win us the Father's love. He came as the gift of the Father's love. We need to go back to to the wonder. He loved me, gave Himself for me. In the past few years in Scotland, a number of Reform ministers have collapsed morally. I've known them. Not all of them, but I've known some of them. Perhaps our first thought should always be there, but for the grace of God, go I. We're never more than a breath away from caving in to soul-destroying, ministry-destroying temptation. So Jesus says to His disciples, watch and pray. (laughs) Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Maybe that's our first thought, but my second thought was this, Lord, why did that happen? How could men so privileged, so used of God, how how could that happen? Why did seemingly faithful, reformed, evangelical men fall so horribly, And, and the falls were horrible? Well, there's no one easy answer, is there? But as I wondered about it, I thought, Lord, was it because they didn't do what John Owen urges us to do? Nothing more incites us to live lives worthy of our calling, to live holy and godly lives than an ever-deepening sense of what God has done for us in the gospel of His Son. This is a surfeit of Owen this morning. Owen wrote in one place, our greatest hindrance in the Christian life is not our lack of effort, but our lack of acquaintedness with our privileges. And then he wrote this other statement, unacquaintedness with our privileges is our sin as well as our trouble. And you see what Owen is saying? He's saying, our fundamental problem is that we don't value the gospel of the grace of God in His Son, Jesus Christ, as we ought unacquaintedness with our privileges is our sin as well as our gospel. That's why Sunday by Sunday, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, Christian Sabbath by Christian Sabbath, 
wherever we are in the Bible, wherever um, Steve or Robert or whoever's preaching from this book, wherever they're preaching in the Scriptures, whether it's Genesis, Leviticus, Ezekiel, Romans, John, Revelation, wherever they are, Jesus Christ should be front and center. Because He is, as He said Himself, in all the Scriptures He is. We need to understand the context, the, the syntax, the grammar. We need to understand the, the, the particularities of, of the text and the circumstances, but all roads lead to Jesus Christ. Because the whole Bible is an unfolding exposition of Genesis 3.15. That's why Thomas Goodwin is so right and I remember the first time I read this, I can't remember, well, Goodwin, 12 volumes, where, where in Goodwin? Well, it's somewhere in volume 5, I think, maybe it's 7, oh, yeah, maybe it's 7. Does anyone know? If thou wouldst know what sin is, go to Mount Calvary. And Owen is saying, as you're tempted to sin, as indwelling sin raises its ugly, vile, multi hydrate head, Look to the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Look to the humiliation of the Son to aggravate the heinousness of the sin that you're contemplating, and then discover the balm of the gospel. Owen writes, set faith on Christ for the killing of thy sin. His blood is the great sovereign remedy for sin-sick souls. Live in this, and thou wilt die a conqueror. Yea, thou wilt, through the good providence of God, live to see thy lust dead at thy feet. So, three brief applications. I, I always think that application should be woven into the text rather than simply an addendum to the text. But three brief applications. Number one, for preachers and pastors, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Nothing will do more good for the sanctification of your people than lifting up Jesus Christ and saying, behold the Lamb of God. Number two, gospel commands are always rooted in gospel grace. There is a grammar to the Bible. There's a theological grammar to the Bible. Now, grammar is a bad word uh, t today. Um, most of the students I teach don't know how to write. Uh, my primary school teacher would have hit me over the head. Well, he'd been jailed for doing that today, probably, but um, he would have smacked me over the head and said, you got a problem? Do you not know the structure of a sentence, Ian? Do you, you not know there's a subject, predicate, and object? Do you not know the nature of clauses? There's a grammar in the Bible. Behold who God is and what God has done, therefore live. You see, maybe I say this too often, everything goes back to God. We have to start with God, go on with God, and finish with God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And thirdly this, no mortification, no life. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For, for all who are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? The sons and daughters of the Most High. Who are those He has adopted into His family and to whom He has given a new nature? Who are they? They are those who put to death by the Spirit the deeds of the body, who do battle with indwelling sin. And you will live. And I used to think Paul meant you will discover what real spiritual life is. And that may be a minor note 
You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. I think he's saying this. If you put to death the deeds of the body by the help of the Spirit, you'll show yourself to be converted men and women who possess life. No holiness, no life. So, set faith on Jesus Christ for the killing of thy sin, and thou wilt die a conqueror. Let me pray. Lord, you see how weak and frail and needy we are, and you have anticipated that. You have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts and lives to be our helper, our strengthener, our enabler. We ask, Lord, for the renewed help of the Holy Spirit to do battle with indwelling remaining sin. We want to be better than we are. We want to live lives that honor you. We want to be the kind of men and women, boys and girls, that you have saved us to be. We want to adorn the gospel by our lives, Lord. And so we pray that we will be those who truly do set their faith on Jesus Christ. We know there's much else, Lord, that needs to be done. But this above all, that we may never, never, never do despite to the precious blood of the Lamb of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And we pray in our Savior's name. Amen.